I used to share my weird experience a lot when I was younger. I was naive enough to think that some people would believe me, but most of the time, they didn't. They just made excuses saying it was dark outside. I was mistaken or tired, so I stopped talking about it. But after hearing your show, I knew I had to share this with you and your listeners. I'm from the lower peninsula of Michigan, the top of the mitten if you know what that means. Up north you'd call it if you were from Detroit. There's not much up here except lakes and trees. It's pretty tough, and we get a lot of tourists in the summer. The winters are cold. Everyone except the locals leave, and there aren't that many of us to go around. So like most rural teenagers at the time, we used to head into the woods and have ourselves a bonfire. It was during one of those bonfires that it happened. This was before cell phones were really a thing, at least not up here yet. So when we were partying, we were cut off from the outside world. Our normal spot was this farmer's field, surrounded on all sides by woods. We learned from the older kids to wait until late fall or early winter to start going there, after the farmer hauled in the last harvest, so we knew there wouldn't be anyone up there. It was sort of a rite of passage in my town. When you were a sophomore or a junior, one of the seniors would let you tag along to one of their parties and show you the spot. Nobody got crazy at these things. It was too cold, and we heard too many stories of kids getting lost in the snow and losing fingers to frostbite. But we always had a good time. I'm telling you this because most people brush off what I tell them, saying I was just young, a panicked teenager. But I was in my right mind when it happened. My sophomore year, we were having one of these bonfires in the field. Everything was normal. Everyone was having a great time. We were burning pieces of an old barn and some furniture an old lady left out for trash. My best friend at the time, I'll call him Mike, was grilling up some frozen burger patties next to me in a rusty old charcoal grill we kept out there. Sarah, also not a real name, but she was standing with us too, chatting away like she always did, when we heard this low rumbling growl. I looked towards the sound of the growling, and at the edge of the firelight, I saw two predatory eyes reflecting the fire back at me. I nudged Mike and Sarah and slowly pointed in the direction of the eyes, trying not to startle whatever was watching us. We were about 10 yards away from the nearest group of partygoers. Sarah was terrified, and she walked slowly backwards to them. She never took her eyes off the edge of the firelight. I don't even think she took a breath the entire time she walked away. I had the exact opposite reaction. I was fascinated by the glowing eyes in the dark. We had been hearing reports that gray wolves were coming back into the lower peninsula from Canada and Wisconsin for a few years now, but all anybody ever saw were flashes on trail cams or tracks in the snow. The Fish and Game Commission couldn't even make up their minds if these were real signs of wolves or people mistaking dogs and coyotes. I was excited at the prospect of being the first person in Lower Michigan to see a wolf in the flesh. I could tell Mike was excited too, because as I slowly stalked forward for a better look, he was glued to my side. Walking up to a potential wolf is a stupid thing to do, but I was young, and I could hear the whispers and murmurs behind me as Sarah alerted the rest of the party to what was going on. I couldn't back down now. Everyone was watching. Mike and I were about seven or so yards away from this supposed wolf. I could just barely make out the outline of its head and ears. It looked almost like a large German Shepherd, but with a broader snout and wider ears. The growl got lower, more menacing like it was no longer warning, but an actual threat. I've heard so many dogs growl, but this was more raspy and guttural like there was something mismatched between the creature's vocal cords and its chest. Mike stopped moving and turned back. I was scared and wanted to turn back too, but I wanted to be the big man at the party more. I wanted the upperclassmen at the bonfire to tell this story next year that this new underclassman had become a local legend, one that they talk about around the bonfire. I noticed a strong odor coming from the wolf. It stank like a wet dog that went for a swim in urine. 
I was about five yards away now, give or take, and I knew I didn't have it in me to get any closer. I could see now that something wasn't right. I could see the outline of this creature's entire body now, and it was not a wolf. The head and legs looked like they belonged on a large German shepherd, but the torso was human-like. It had broad muscular shoulders and a large hump of dense muscle on its back. I stumbled back. My foot hit a rock or a stick or something. I don't know, but it made a noise and startled the creature. It stood up on its hind legs and snarled. Now, I'm 5'10", and the creature was looking at me eye to eye. Its breath was hot and smelled horrific. I fell backwards onto my butt and scrambled away as fast as I could in that position. I threw handfuls of dirt and rocks in the creature's direction, while desperately trying to get back to the fire. The creature ran into the woods while making this whooping howl. The entire party just stared at me in silence. Over the years, that whole incident morphed into a joke about some kid getting scared by the farmer's dog or coyote. I've even heard a version of it where it was an unusually large raccoon. I don't blame people. I would probably think the same thing if I wasn't the one who saw it up close. Mike was the only one close enough to really see anything, and he won't talk about it. He changes the subject every time I bring it up, so I stopped asking him about it. Sometimes I wonder if something horrible would have happened if we didn't notice those eyes at the edge of the firelight. Maybe if someone left the party to go take a pee or make out in the bushes, this would be an unsolved murder instead of a local joke. Either way, I guess I'm just glad that we're all safe. I'm always amazed at how people have shared some crazy stories. There's no doubt there's a lot to this world that we just don't understand. I've seen some strange things myself, and I finally got up enough courage to share something with you and your audience. It was the most disturbing thing I've ever experienced in my life. I'm a forest ranger at the Hiawatha National Forest in Michigan. Working here is a dream job. When I was a kid, my parents used to bring us here for family vacations in the summer. It's gorgeous and I love it, so it made sense for me to do my part to help preserve this wonderful environment. I don't remember seeing anything strange when I was a kid, but working here is a totally different story. I hear about weird experiences from visitors all the time, but I'd say most of it is mistaken identity, like someone thinking a bear is a Bigfoot. But I know what I saw, and there's no mistaking it for a bear. It started with a call to the ranger station about an assault taking place at one of the campgrounds. I and another ranger who I'll call Tom drove out to see what was going on. What we found at the scene was something out of a horror movie. A man had gone crazy trying to kill his family. He was armed with a bowie knife and had his wife and child cornered, but the wife was able to hold him off with a hunting rifle. We pulled our guns and told him to drop his weapon, but he wouldn't comply. His wife was terrified, but she begged us not to shoot him. While Tom kept his gun ready, I pulled out a baton and disarmed and subdued the man. As I handcuffed him, he kept repeating one word underneath his breath. Wendigo. Wendigo. It was creepy and it sent a shiver up my spine. The cops arrived and as they took a report from the woman, I overheard her say that they had been camping for a few days. Her husband went hunting by himself, but when he returned, he began acting strangely. He suddenly became withdrawn and started talking to himself, claiming he had seen a strange creature in the forest. When the woman tried talking to him, he lashed out at her. The child was getting scared and the woman demanded they leave, but the man refused. Finally, he went berserk and turned his attention to his wife and child. She thought he was possessed and was convinced it wasn't him, saying that his facial features even changed. The cops took the family to the police station, leaving Tom and me pretty shaken. Sure, I've had to break up disturbances and drunken behavior before, but nothing like this. I asked Tom if he heard the man uttering the word Wendigo. He shook his head no, but I didn't believe him. I could tell he was scared. I've heard that the Wendigo is a Native American myth. I didn't think it was something that anyone believes in this day and age. It's said that the creature is capable 
of pulling people under its spell and driving them to insanity, murder, and even cannibalism. If I ever heard anyone speak of it, it was only as a campfire tale. Over the next couple of days, I became obsessed. I learned the woman and the child were safe, but as soon as the husband was driven out of the forest, it was like he snapped out of a trance and had no recollection of what he had done. I heard this through police friends, but strangely in the news, it was reported that the man was high on drugs. Seemed like someone was covering this up. I guess to protect the reputation of the National Forest or the U.S. Forest Service. On my breaks, I looked at the trail cams where the family was camping. I tracked down the footage of the man hunting and saw something quite odd. At one point, he approached something off camera with his rifle aimed, but then he stopped. He dropped the gun and he stood motionless, staring at whatever it was. He wasn't facing the camera and was about 10 yards away, so I couldn't see his face. He literally stood there, rooted in place for over three hours. The sun began to set and he finally picked up his gun and walked away. A few minutes later, a shadowy hulking figure darted across the trail. It was so fast, just like a blur of motion but I paused it and was able to make out something that looked like it walked out of a nightmare. What was most distinguishable was its head, a deer skull with 50 point antlers, five zero. I counted them like three times. I thought it was a mask, but the rest of the figure was skeletal as well. It had the legs of a deer and its body was emaciated. Its arms were long and lanky with claws that also looked like antlers. I immediately told my supervisor and showed him the footage, but he said it wasn't what I thought it was and told me to drop the subject. Something was up and he obviously wasn't telling me everything. I told Tom about it, but he didn't want to get involved. I forced him to look at the footage, but when I searched the database, it was gone. Everything involving that family had been erased. Tom simply said, sometimes it's best to leave well enough alone. I was confused, but then I was called in by my supervisor. He explained that the issue was sensitive and not something for the U.S. Forest Service to handle. It fell on the Native American tribes. The area where the family was camping was now off limits, and I was told to stay away until further notice. A month later, that camping area reopened. I heard from Tom that it had been cleansed. It was clear that this incident had roots deeper than I understood, and as Tom said before, Sometimes it's best to just leave well enough alone. To say that I'm a huge fan of your channel would be an understatement. I've been a truck driver for five years, and I actually listen to it while I'm on the road. I never thought I'd be able to contribute something myself, but now that day has arrived. While I'm not 100% certain what I saw, I'm 99.9% .9 certain that it was not of this earth. Let me start from the beginning. I'm an owner operator and I schedule shipments through the same broker that I've used since I started. I got a call regarding an urgent load that needed to be transported from Long Beach, California to Amarillo, Texas. He was vague about the cargo and the company, which should have been the first red flag, but I didn't think much of it and I agreed to the job. I arrived at the port of Long Beach where I was directed to a pier that was cordoned off. There were a lot of black unmarked vehicles and men in military uniforms with no ranks or insignia. I had to go through a rigorous security checkpoint where they thoroughly pat me down and checked my ID and also searched my truck. I never experienced anything like this before, which should have been another red flag, but I figured it was too late to turn back now. Here's where it starts to get strange. They wouldn't let me in the back of my truck, and instead someone else drove it away, and I was told it would return with a loaded container already hitched. I said I don't approve, because I like to inspect the cargo and make sure it's properly loaded and secured. I didn't want to be liable for anything, but they assured me that the container is sealed, and as long as the seal remained unbroken upon delivery, I wouldn't be responsible for anything. It's not the first time I've driven a sealed container, so I shrugged it off and gave them the paperwork, but they refused to divulge what I would be transporting. It made me uncomfortable, 
but as I looked at the armed men around me, I didn't argue. They gave me other paperwork to sign, simply stating that the container was preloaded and sealed. They promised a sizable bonus to Amarillo if everything worked out. They knew this was unorthodox, but said not to worry, which only made me more curious. An hour later, they returned to my truck with a shipping container, and I got out of there as fast as I could. As I drove, I kept replaying the events in my mind. What was in that container? Why hire an owner-operator for something so secretive? What shadowy organization did they belong to? Why armed men? Whatever it was, it was heavy. My imagination began to run wild. Hours later, around 2 or 3 in the morning, I was on the I-40 in Arizona, approaching the border of New Mexico. There was no one else on that lonely stretch of desert on There was no one else on that lonely stretch of desert at that hour. And this is when the really crazy stuff began to happen. There was a flash of light in the sky, which I dismissed as lightning. But when it happened again, I realized it was actually coming from a nearby mountain. And I swear I saw something shoot out of it and disappear into the sky. A round, bright object that moved at an incredible speed. I glanced out the window for a better look and almost drove off the road. Hovering above me was this black triangle-shaped craft. It was hard to see in the darkness, but it blotted out the clear starry sky. It made no sound and followed at my pace. It was huge, the size of a football field. I don't know why I thought I could outrun it, but I instinctively stepped on the gas. The next thing I knew, a glowing white object pulled up next to me. It paused for a moment and then zipped right past me. Not sure how familiar you are with Tic Tac UFOs reported by the Navy a few years ago, but that's what it looked like. Scared out of my mind, I glanced out the window again and saw a triangle craft still above. That's when another Tic Tac circled my truck. It moved clockwise around me while maintaining the speed that I was driving, which was around 80 miles per hour. Then it shot up straight and disappeared. It defied all logic and physics. I focused on the road and finally pulled into a truck stop near Gallup, New Mexico. I don't know how long I sat there before getting out, but it took a while to wrap my head around what was happening. The triangle craft was nowhere to be seen. I have no idea how long it followed me before disappearing. The only conclusion I could come to was that it was related to whatever was in that container. I continued on to Albuquerque, where I was supposed to take a 10-hour break, but I just wanted to dump this load. I kept going and finished the last leg to Amarillo without incident. I dropped off the container at a facility that had no markings and was greeted by more armed men in unmarked uniforms. They asked how the drive went and if I encountered anything along the way, but I told them nothing happened. Pretty sure they didn't believe me, but they didn't say anything and I didn't care. They drove my truck away and an hour later returned it without the container. I was given a nice cash bonus, but the money meant nothing. I went to a nearby motel and crashed for several hours. When I woke up, my arms and face were red with some kind of rash. I went to the doctor and was told it was radiation burns. I'm taking some time off while I heal, and I'm hesitant to go back driving. Even if I do, there's one thing for sure. I'm done taking jobs from that broker. I just started a few weeks ago as a clerk in a big hotel in Boston, Massachusetts. When I say big, I mean it's got 39 floors. I got the usual training, how to answer a phone, input reservations in the computer, magnetize key cards, but Mary Jo, who trained me, told me one weird thing. She said room 1313 is never given to a guest. I didn't ask why because Mary Jo is one of those people. Like, you don't ask her questions. Besides, I figured it was just a superstitious thing. 1313. Some old buildings don't even have a 13th floor. So I didn't think much of it, really. I just did my job, answered the phone, and dealt with the cranky guests that you'd expect. After a while, they put me on as a night clerk. I wasn't surprised. I knew I'd been hired to work that shift, but they were waiting to have me fully trained first. I was prepared, 
I switched up my sleep schedule and loaded some games on my phone. On our phone system, you can tell where a call is coming from. Laundry room, kitchen, office, or even which guest room. So you can imagine what I thought when a call came from room 1313. I answered it, thinking it was a mistake somehow. Maybe the phone's wires got crossed. There was nothing on the other end. Just something that sounded like air rushing. Or maybe somebody breathing. Okay, so it was scary. It was like 3 a.m. or so and nobody was around. No guests hanging around the lobby, no cleaning people wandering through. There's a security guard somewhere, but I didn't know where he was. I just hung up and sat there sweating. I kept telling myself it was nothing, a glitch, whatever. Then the phone rang again, room 1313. I let it ring. 10 times and the answering service will get it. I couldn't help it. I had to know what was going on. I picked up the phone on ring 9 and said the standard greeting. More breathing, but this time something else, like a pop noise. I put down the receiver gently, like I was trying to not get upset at whoever was on the other end. I played games on my phone for a while and the security guard wandered by. I thought about asking him if he knew anything about 1313, but I was scared to hear the answer. I jumped when it rang again. But this time it was room 1214, wanting more towels. The clock ticked over to 4 a.m. And then the phone rang again, 1313. I picked up and said, what do you want? No answer, breathing in another weird pop. Now I was sure somebody was messing with me. This had to be an initiation ritual or some sick joke. I marched down the hall to the elevators. I got in and pressed for the 13th floor. The hallway was dim and quiet, hardly even a TV noise. I could hear my shoes on the carpet. I stopped in front of room 1313 and used the universal key card to unlock the door. I could barely make myself open it, but I had to know if this was a prank. The room smelled musty, but it looked like all the other rooms. Paisley carpet, white bedspreads, fake wood dresser, and the phone on the nightstand was off the hook. My legs felt shaky as I walked over to it. I hung it up. As I left, I could see my hand shaking. I didn't think it was a prank, but when I got to the lobby, I called Mose, the security guard. Are you pranking me, I asked him. Are you the one calling from 1313? No, he said. Let me come to the lobby. He came a couple minutes later and leaned against the counter. Room 1313 is haunted, he said. Stop messing with me. It is, he insisted. Weird stuff happens in that room. Why do you think they don't let anybody stay there? So a ghost is calling the front desk, I said. Why? He went on to tell me about how 11 years ago, a guest didn't check out on time. Housekeeping found her dead, alone, and on the bed. No one knew what had happened. She hadn't been with anyone. And no signs of trauma, heart attack, undetectable poison, no one ever found out. Okay, so what do I do, I asked. Mose shrugged and just walked off. The phone rang again, 1313. I answered it. What do you want? Breathing, popping noises. I hung up. Now I was completely tired of this crap. I went back up to the room. I was still scared, but more just mad. I opened the door and the phone was off the hook. I tore it out of the wall. Maybe it was my imagination, but the phone felt weird, almost like it was vibrating. I stowed it in the storeroom where we kept all kinds of extra crap, like phones, TVs, and clocks. I went back to the desk. Now people were starting to wake up because it was 5 a.m. That made me a little less scared. After a while, the phone rang, 13, 14. Hey man, I don't know who's in the room next door, but they got the TV turned up really loud, the guy said. 1313, I asked. Yeah, the guy said. I went up there. Now I was pissed. This ghost was really causing trouble. The remote control was on the bed. I was sure it hadn't been there before. I took the TV, the remote, and the radio. Now what are you going to do, I said. Yeah, I was talking to myself, but it made me feel less scared. The stuff felt weird, though. The way the phone had, and it made me a little freaked out. After that, though, everything was quiet. I keep expecting the ghost to figure out some other way to communicate 
or to amuse itself or whatever it was trying to do. It hasn't happened yet, though. Hi, Donovan. I'm a fire specialist with the Department of Natural Resources in a northwestern state, but I'm not comfortable saying which state. In case anyone out there is not familiar with that title, a fire specialist is just like a regular firefighter, except that we only deal with fires that happen in our parks and game lands. I'm the type of guy who just clocks in, does what he's told, clocks out at the end of the day, and leaves it behind. Life is just too short to dwell on your job after you punch out that clock. But recently, something happened on the job that disturbed me. I've been back and forth over whether I should say something. My wife says no, that I should leave it be, but I think people have the right to know. One of our state forests here is very large and very popular. It's a great place for fishing and camping, and it gets pretty crowded in good weather. A buddy of mine is a ranger there. We were having a few drinks one night, and he told me that there has been a rash of Bigfoot sightings in the park. Now, you might laugh, but I didn't, and neither did he. It's more common than you think for people to see strange things in the forest, at least around here. While I personally have never seen anything that looked like a Bigfoot, there's been times where I've been in the woods and felt like something was watching me. And mind you, that's even happened after an area has been evacuated of the general public, when we're about to do a controlled burn. Now, when my buddy told me that, I just asked him if anyone had managed to get any pictures. We're all waiting for that day, you know when someone finally snaps a picture and proves the existence of these things. He said no, but he and one of the other rangers decided to set up some game cameras right in the same area that people had been reporting seeing the creature. I didn't think too much of it. I just said cool and keep me posted, and we moved on to another subject. Then, about a week later, my buddy calls me all excited and says they did it. They got an image. I was stunned. He said it was pretty clear, and no one would be able to say it was fake. So, of course, I wanted to see it. He told me to come by on his station whenever I could get over there. It's about an hour away. Well, we had some family stuff come up right after that, or I would have gone immediately. Nothing serious, but you know, family comes first. It was five days later when I called my friend back, and I said I'd like to come by in two days' time, which was my next day off. I had to leave a voicemail because he didn't pick up his phone. Then, the evening before I was supposed to go see him, I got a call from my supervisor. He instructed me to report the next day to the regional office for a control burn. I was like, um, hello, it's my day off. There were no wildfires going on, so why pull me in? He said it was non-negotiable, and that was that. He didn't have any details, just said I'd find out more at the regional office. So that sucked, but whatever. I showed up there the next day with five other guys, and we were given the specifics. I was shocked. We were going to burn a whopping 500 acres based on a spur of the moment decision. I bet you can guess where too. Yep, they were having us do a ping pong ball drop right smack over the area that had all the Bigfoot sightings. A ping pong ball drop is when we fly over with a PSD dispenser on board. It injects glycol into a plastic sphere, which contains potassium permanganate. Then it shoots it out of the helicopter. The combo triggers the thermogenic reaction, igniting the area in a flash. The only times I've ever been involved in a ping pong ball drop was when an area was already on fire. It's safer than going in on foot. I've never seen it used for a prescribed burn around here before. So we did it. 500 acres went up in flames, and I couldn't help but to wonder if the reason was they found out that Bigfoot creature was really in there. I tried calling my friend, wanting to get his take on it. I kept getting voicemail and he never called me back. So finally I had a day off and went over to the park he worked at. There was a new guy there that I never met before. He said my buddy had been transferred but he didn't know where. This whole thing reeks to me of a cover up. Last time I talked to him, he was excited about him and another ranger finally getting some pics of the Sasquatch. I wish he had told me the last name of the other guy though I wouldn't be surprised if he was transferred too. Anyway, I wrote him a letter telling him about the ping pong ball drop. I didn't say too much, just in case the letter gets intercepted. 
but I wanted him to know, in case he didn't already. I figured his mail would get forwarded to wherever he is living now. All I can think is he's avoiding me, maybe because he was told not to talk about the picture. It would take a pretty serious threat though for him to stay quiet. He's pretty hard-headed. I guess that's all I got to say, except now whenever I'm told to do a controlled burn, I'm going to wonder if there's an ulterior motive. How you doing Donovan? I'm a big fan of your YouTube channel. I was always skeptic when it came to the weird and paranormal stuff. And while the stories on your show are very entertaining, I didn't necessarily believe it. But now I'm a true believer, thanks to a series of strange occurrences that I experienced firsthand. I'm a small town cop in rural Michigan. I was born and raised here, and I can't imagine being anywhere else. When I was growing up, I remember stories about haunted places and Sasquatch sightings. They were just stories to scare kids, and I eventually grew out of it. There's one story in particular, though, about an old abandoned house in the woods on the outskirts of town. It was built in the 1800s, and the patriarch of the family supposedly went crazy claiming to see demons before killing his wife and kids, and then himself. There's no record that it actually happened, so I chalked it up to an urban legend, but generations of kids dared each other to go in that house by themselves. Even I went in there in high school. It was like a rite of passage. Sure, it's creepy, but it's old and dilapidated. So what do you expect? Nothing's ever happened anyway, and you end up scaring yourself with anticipation. In recent years, it's been a home to junkies, so it's not very safe. I think that contributed to waning interest in the place, until a tragic incident a year ago. A few high school kids went to the house and messed around with a Ouija board. A few days later, one of them hung himself in the house. It was a pretty big deal around here, and a lot of people were very spooked. Some were convinced the kid was possessed by demons. But if you look at his history, he was bullied at school and didn't have many friends. In fact, the group that he went with weren't his real friends, and they admitted they only took him there to play a prank, which they filmed and posted online. That being said, his family claimed that he kept talking about a being he kept seeing leading up to his death. He described it as human, but not human. It was gaunt and naked with pale white skin. Its eyes were black. It had no nose, and it made this clicking sound with its tongue and thin lips. People wanted to believe this sensational version, but I thought it was a textbook case of a poor kid being bullied. The thing he described sounded like a junkie he may have run into at the house, and maybe he had some bad dreams about it. Nonetheless, it started as a ghost challenge trend online, where kids would go in the house and post videos on social media. I've seen some of these videos and they're clearly fake, designed to set up a cheap jump scare or even use poor CGI effects. But six months later, there was another incident. A girl and her friends took up the ghost challenge. Then late one night, she drove off of a road and died when she crashed into a tree. Again, people said it was demons, but really, that road is dark, twisty and infamous for car wrecks. As tragic as it was, I didn't question it because accidents happen there frequently. We talked to her friends and they were scared, claiming the girl rambled on about some strange being she kept seeing in her bedroom. What she described was the exact same thing the other kid saw. I admit it was weird, but rumors about the other kid had already been going around, so she could have easily been influenced by that. The incident was enough so that there were calls to demolish the house and make the area off limits. I was tasked with boarding up the place and marking it off with police tape. Meanwhile, plans were made to tear down the house in a week. I drove there by myself one afternoon, and maybe it was because of everything going on, but I was pretty anxious. I went in the house to chase out the junkies, and as I looked around, I heard this weird clicking sound, like something you make with your tongue. I immediately thought about what that kid heard, but I was sure it was just somebody in the place. I did a sweep of the house, but I found no one. I kept hearing that clicking sound, always coming from another room. But when I'd look into that room, it was empty 
and the sound would come from a different room. It started to freak me out, so I quickly nailed the door shut and put up the police tape and hightailed it out of there. As I walked to my car, the clicking sound followed behind me at a distance. I started to run, but the sound got louder and louder until it was directly near my ear. It made the hair on my back of my neck stand up. I finally jumped in my car and sped off. I didn't hear that sound anymore, and I refused to look in the rearview mirror, afraid of what I'd see. When I got home, I sat in the car for a while, trying to process all that took place. It was long enough so that my wife eventually came out to see what was wrong, but I didn't tell her. Later that night, I saw it. I woke up after this horrible nightmare, and I couldn't move a muscle like sleep paralysis. The figure stood at the foot of my bed, watching me. It was ghostly, naked, and pale, exactly like those kids described. Its eyes were black, round voids. My wife slept soundly next to me, but that thing wasn't interested in her. It only focused on me. I was petrified. I couldn't move. I couldn't even scream. I stared at it for hours until dawn, when it finally faded away as the sun came up. I've heard sleep paralysis can be terrifying and similar to what I experienced, so I told myself that was just what it was. But then it happened again. The second time I woke up to find the figure standing right next to me. The third time it leaned directly over me from the head of the bed, which is impossible because the bed is pushed up against the wall. I barely got any sleep and I felt like I was losing my mind. I was afraid to tell anyone because I'd be ridiculed but my wife and co-workers definitely noticed I was distracted. A week later, they finally demolished that house, and everything stopped. It took a while for my mind to settle, but I was eventually able to sleep again. I can't prove that what I experienced was real, but I know in my gut that it was. And I don't doubt those kids anymore. Hopefully, we won't be plagued by that nightmare again. Hey there Donovan, love the channel, I listen to it every chance I get. Whether it's doing laundry, catching the bus, or out for a run, you could say that I'm obsessed. I'm always waiting to hear someone with a similar experience to me. Let me explain. The first time I saw them was when I was a teenager. Who is them you ask? I hesitate to say because it's so laughable. But let me be clear, the last thing they are is funny. I used to roll my eyes whenever someone would talk about aliens and UFOs. The only thing I could conjure up in my mind was E.T., that goofy looking creature with a long neck, big eyes, and a light bulb for a fingertip. I saw the movie when I was a kid, so to me, aliens were these friendly, candy-eating things that just wanted to go home. I assure you, this is not an accurate portrayal. My first encounter with them was when I was 14. Even though it was nearly 20 years ago, I'll never forget it. Have you ever heard of a lucid dream? A dream so vivid, you thought it was real. That's what it was like. I went to bed one night, worried about the science test I had the next day. I didn't study and I needed a good grade, otherwise I was looking at summer school. I was so stressed out, I had trouble sleeping and would wake up at the slightest disturbance. Wind blowing in the trees, dad snoring, the neighbor's dog barking. I remember waking up to this bright light coming through the window, like a giant spotlight. I covered my eyes wondering what was going on. It was blinding, but it only lasted a few seconds and quickly dissipated. That's when the nightmare began. The light died down. I became aware of a sickening stench, like rotten garbage. Can you smell in your dreams? I didn't think so. It was then that I saw a silhouette standing at the foot of my bed. I tried to sit up, but I couldn't move a muscle. I was frozen in place and I could only move my eyes to look around. The figure didn't look human. It didn't look like E.T. either. But it was kind of similar. Short with a large bulbous head, long skinny neck and slender body and arms. It slowly moved around the bed towards me, but it didn't walk. It floated. As it got closer, I could see its large oval black eyes. I had never seen anything like it. They were blacker than black, like a void, 
an emptiness that stretched into infinity. The creature reached out its hand and extended its finger. No, it didn't light up. It touched my forehead and then suddenly I heard voices. It was kind of like flipping through the channels on a radio station with different languages until it finally settled on an English-speaking station. A voice called me by name and said that they had been looking for me. To say I was petrified would be an understatement. The creature leaned in and I kept staring into those black voids until they swallowed me. The next thing I knew, I was in an antiseptic room that had no walls. I don't know how to describe it, but there was no depth, and as vast as it seemed, it was also claustrophobic. I was strapped to some kind of gurney. I still couldn't move. The most horrifying part was that I was now surrounded by seven of those creatures, and they were all looming over me. One of them reached out and grabbed me by the jaw, forcing my mouth open. I'll never forget the clammy feeling of its hands. There was no warmth like a human touch, and it was cold and dead. Another being held up this contraption that I can only describe as a drill made out of flesh and bone. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. I was a prisoner trapped in my own body, and only my consciousness remained. They shoved that drill down my throat, and I felt every ounce of pain and discomfort. I heard a voice in my head. It was them, speaking telepathically again, telling me that I was part of some experiment and that I should be honored that I was chosen. Not gonna lie, honor was not the first feeling that came to my mind. Whatever that contraption was, I felt it slither down my throat, into my stomach winding through my intestines. I'll spare you the details of where it came out, but you can use your imagination. The next thing I knew, I bolted up in bed, coughing and gagging. I clutched my throat as the alarm chirped on the nightstand and morning sunlight poured through the window. I grabbed that damn alarm and chucked it across the room. At the time, I thought it was just a dream, but my throat and my stomach were sore. Not like I was sick, but like something had been rammed down my throat and ripped out. Needless to say, I failed my science test. My parents weren't happy about it, but I never told them what happened that night. I struggled for a long time afterwards, trying to determine if it was real or not. Only recently, I've come to the conclusion that yes, it was very real. What led to that decision? Well, it happened again. Just last week, same dream. Only this time, they said I was about to enter a new phase of the experiment. When I woke up, there was a small lump on my stomach and a tiny scar. What scares me is that the lump has grown a little each day. I'm afraid to go to the doctor. I'm afraid to sleep. I can't tell anyone, not even my family or friends, because they'll think I'm crazy. But I thought the listeners of your show might understand. If you believe in God, please pray for me. Dear Donovan, I never thought I'd be saying this, but I'm now a believer in the supernatural. I was always a skeptic but I recently saw something that definitely wasn't far from the natural world. I'm a rock hound. I dig for crystals like amethyst and smoky quartz in my free time. I've made a few really cool finds, like a 15 inch long green barrel piece that I sold for $200, and a few small clusters of ruby, which I've kept from my collection. I live near the White Mountains of New Hampshire, and I'd been working on the mountainside littered with feldspar that seemed promising. A storm had uprooted some trees in the area, and I found signs of quartz when I dug into one of the pits left behind the root ball. If you see quartz mixing with feldspar anywhere, it's a pretty good indicator that there might be amethyst close by. And when a tree uproots, you've got a lot of the hard work done already, not as much to dig. I had dug a pretty good sized pit over the course of three weeks, just on my days off, and now it was between six and seven feet deep with the side shored up. Once it got to be near the five foot mark, I'd brought a small stepladder with me to leave at the site. Using the stepladder at the bottom of the hole, combined with my usual rope looped around a nearby tree, I could navigate in and out without any trouble. On this particular day, I was going at it, making real progress. I got pretty excited when I found a large chunk of smoky quartz with amethyst tips. 
I was tempted to stop and wash it off, but I was in a groove so I just kept on digging. Besides, I knew I was going to have to stop in about an hour to dump the buckets of dirt that I had almost filled up. I usually don't tell people where I'm digging because I don't want to do all this work and then have someone come in the minute I leave and find the prize, taking advantage of my setup. That's happened to me before and it really sucked. But this time I told my friend Jeff, because he's just starting with gem hunting and I trust him. I gave Jeff pretty good directions, being that you have to park about a half a mile away on a logging road. So when I heard someone walking nearby, you know, twigs snapping and stuff, I was pretty sure it was Jeff. This place is pretty remote. I had been camping out in a nearby clearing most of my weekends and I never saw anyone else. I just kept working, knowing Jeff would see my backpack and the red flags on posts marking the pit, which I did as a precaution against someone, or me, stumbling in and breaking a leg. The footsteps came near, stopping pretty close by, so I quit digging and looked up saying, hey man, is that you? Fully expecting to see Jeff's face peering down at me. No response in nothing but sky. Then a hail of small rocks like little pebbles came sailing in. A few bounced off my shoulder and back, and they didn't hurt, but still I was like, what the hell? Not funny, dude, I said totally annoyed. I turned around and put one foot on the stepladder, intending to come up and educate him on what you don't do when someone's in the pit. I had just started to rise up, still on that bottom rung, when a shower of dirt came raining down on me right in my face. I yelled, what the hell? Cause the dirt had gotten my eyes. Now I was really pissed. I bent my head trying to shake the dirt off me, wiping my face and blinking my eyes. When the light changed above me, I squinted to look up. There was this thing looking down at me. It was as big as a man, but it wasn't human. The head looked like an iguana, except it had a flat face without a snout, just slits for a nose. Definitely reptile looking, green and scaly and it was staring right at me. I swear it was as big as me, if not bigger. Even with my eyes streaming tears from all the crap in them, I could see shoulders and a neck. Like this thing was bent over, but standing on two feet, not lying on its belly. It had these huge gold eyes with black slits for pupils, kind of like a snake. I was so shocked I fell right on my butt, right at the bottom of the pit, whacking my shoulder on one of the buckets. Lying there, I felt absolutely terrified and trapped, like a bug under glass. This thing was looking at me like I was a meal. You can't imagine what that felt like, to have nowhere to run, just stuck there in that hole. It moved away, disappearing, and I got my wits about me. I immediately got into a crouch and grabbed my shovel, holding it like a weapon. I didn't know what I was going to do, but the one thing I knew, I wasn't going without a fight. I waited, still trying to process what I'd seen. And a minute later, I hear this sound like something being dragged across the dirt close by. I was tempted to try to climb out of the pit really quick and make a run for it. But I'm ashamed to say, I was too scared. I was just like that cliche you hear, paralyzed with fear. All of a sudden, the tips of the branches come into view, moving over the top of that hole. Pine bows with half-dead needles on them that the whatever it was must have dragged over. The branches started slowly blocking out the light. That thing seemed to be laying on the branches over the top of the pit, causing a little shower of dirt and debris to come falling in on me. It might sound weird, but when this happened, it gave me hope. I started thinking I might get out of this after all. My worst fear was getting buried alive. My second worst fear was getting eaten right there on the spot. So what it was doing now, yeah, it gave me some hope. I think it might have been covering me up to save me for later. I really don't know. So I just waited, getting pretty claustrophobic as the light was about 80% blocked out now. I just stayed quiet and listened. After a while, I thought I heard it leave, some twigs snapping in the forest nearby. I knew I wouldn't have any trouble pushing the limbs out of the way, and I still had my stepladder and rope. I wasn't trapped but I was still afraid. What if it was out there? Could I defend myself with just a shovel? I hadn't seen its whole body, but it looked as big as me. I just decided to wait a few minutes longer. I just sat there replaying my favorite songs in my head, 
trying to calm myself down. Maybe five minutes later, I hear some movement nearby, and my stomach clenched up again, thinking I'd waited too long and now this thing was going to eat me after all. I gripped my shovel and waited, watching the branches overhead. Then I heard my name called. It was Jeff, thank God. I shouted back I was in the pit covered with branches, near the red flags. I yelled, don't fall in, because that's the last thing we needed, right? A minute later, Jeff was pulling the branches out of the way and looking down at me completely confused. How in the world did you do that, he asked. He helped me out and I went right over to my backpack and got a drink of my water. My hands were shaking. I told him there was something in the woods there and we needed to leave right away. And then I'd tell him about it after we got into our vehicles. I was not going to stand there and have this thing come back while we were talking. Then I just turned and left and he followed me asking questions the whole way. But I waited till I saw my truck before I said much. I was so freaking relieved to get in my vehicle. I think adrenaline had kept me going that whole time. And once I got somewhere safe, all the energy just went right out of me. I told Jeff what happened. And while he didn't think I was making it up, he didn't believe it was a monster. He thought my vision got messed up from the dirt and that it was really some wise ass person tried to cover the pit with branches messing around with me. He even suggested it was a human wearing a mask. But who would be out in the middle of nowhere wearing a mask? I know what I saw, and I'm never going back there again, not even to collect my gear. I count myself lucky to be alive. In July of 2017, I was working in Wexford County, Michigan as a biologist conducting a study of Michigan native wolf packs to get an accurate idea of their pack sizes and territories around the area. I was living in a trailer near the edge of the woods where I could easily access any of the areas within my study if needed. Inside my trailer I had a CB scanner to listen in on, hopeful it would give me some guidance on any wolf sightings in the area. The night I saw the creature, I was just finishing heating up a bowl of macaroni and cheese in the microwave when the scanner called out that someone was hearing wolves howl about a mile east of where I was parked. I decided to forego my dinner and headed out that way. One of my usual wolves that I had been tracking had been missing for a couple of days. I was hopeful it would be her. I loaded up my gear and headed towards the address where the report was called in from. When I got there, there were several people standing outside in the yard staring into the dark field behind the home. I asked if that was where the wolf was heard coming from, and several nodded, but nobody really spoke. They all looked somewhat in shock, as if they had just witnessed something terrible or otherworldly. I asked the one guy that was standing towards the edge of the crowd if he had seen the wolf, and if it was okay. He turned and looked at me with a puzzled look on his face, and told me simply that, he didn't know what he saw, but that it wasn't any normal wolf. As he said it, the thing howled from the back in the field. It sounded like a typical wolf howl, but it had a higher pitched screech to it, almost reminiscent of what you'd expect to hear in old stories about banshees and witches. It echoed over the whole area with this eerie silence that followed. Not even the crickets or frogs were making sounds. The guy standing near me suddenly pulled his phone out of his pocket. It was lit up with a text message from somebody. They're over there, he said. They're gonna turn on the spotlights. When he said it, two men rushed to their pickups and started adjusting these spotlights. All at once, spotlights lit up the adjacent end of the field, as well as our end, and there in the middle of the field stood something I can only describe as being almost werewolf-like. It was hard to tell from where we stood exactly how tall this thing might be, but it looked big. It had a muscular upper body balanced on two short legs, and it was covered in dark fur. There was a long, toothy snout, and its eyes reflected back the light of the spotlights as it looked around, taking in all of its surroundings. It let out another massive screeching howl, sending many people running to hide in their cars, before it took off in a dead run straight for the crowd I was standing in. There were more people standing across the field than there were standing on our side. I guess it opted for the path of least resistance. 
As it ran for us, we all moved in a hurry to get out of its path. Nobody wanted to wind up being a meal for a hungry wolf man or werewolf, or whatever it might be. I jumped back in my truck, and an older man jumped in along with me on the passenger side. I guess it was just the luck of the draw that I happened to be parked right in the pathway of where this thing wanted to run. He ran straight towards the truck, leaping onto the hood and then scurrying across the roof of the truck and over the bed before disappearing into the darkness behind me. We waited for a few minutes to be sure that we were safe. Then me and the old man and a few others came back out of our vehicles to survey the damage. To this day, I'm still driving that truck around with dents and scratches on the hood. The most bizarre part of it all, though, was the odor. A thick, doggy odor hung in the air around us for at least a good hour as we stood around trying to make sense of what we had seen. That creature was long gone, but its scent hung in the air as if someone was burning a candle. A few weeks later, I was out at night trying to get a good count on some wolf pups that were on their first hunt when I smelled that odor again. Needless to say, I abandoned my hunt for the pups and made my way back to the truck and headed for camp. I wasn't going to risk coming face to face with that thing again. I don't work with wolves anymore. Instead, I accepted a new assignment, keeping track of slugs and snails in the creek beds of Illinois. It's quiet work, but at least I'm a lot safer. Hi Donovan, I recently found your channel and was immediately hooked because I have a similar story as to what you narrate on your channel. I've been waiting for a chance to tell this story, so here it is. This happened to my spouse and I, who was my fiance at the time, but we are now happily married and have four children. We still talk about what happened to us on that dark, desolate Florida highway. It's something we just won't ever forget and there's no explanation other than something supernatural. I was always open to the possibility that we are not alone, but now I'm 100% convinced. We live in South Florida near the bustling city of Miami. My parents lived on Florida's west coast, near Naples when this happened, and the only way to get there years ago was to take the two-hour stretch of drive through the rural, desolate, and mostly dark highway through the Everglades called Alligator Alley. They call it that because of the number of alligators constantly getting out into the road and almost actually causing car accidents. This encounter happened many years ago, when it was a one-lane highway each way, and there were no cell phones, no pay phones, no towers, and the only light poles were miles apart. In fact, the only light at night was that of your car headlights. Trust me, it was not the place to break down. You'd wait for hours for another car to come by if you needed any help. We loved the drive because we both worked full time and I was in college and my fiance was in medical school. Because of our hectic work and school schedules, we cherished the long drive ahead of us after work. We could talk and catch up and just listen to songs on the radio if we could manage to get a station. Most of the time though, it was just static. On this night, we had gotten a late start to my parents and it was already dark outside, but we didn't mind. We loved the drive. Well, I should say we loved it until about 30 minutes into the drive. Way, way out of the city and now in the middle of nowhere Everglades, I looked out of my window on the passenger side and saw a very strange set of lights. They were in the air in the middle of the marshy Everglades, above some mangroves about 30 feet away. Keep in mind, the only way to travel those swamps was by an airboat, as there are absolutely no roads other than the rickety one we were on. Surrounding the road is brackish, marshy swamp water filled with dangerous predators, hence the name Alligator Alley. So basically, it was a two-lane desolate road surrounded by thousands upon thousands of acres of swampy Everglades on either side, and absolutely nothing else. The lights appeared up in the air outside my passenger window, seemingly out of nowhere, as if they just flipped on. It was a row of five lights in a perfect V-shape that I saw first, and then I saw the rest, a massive dark shape just hovering. The car window's reflection made it hard to see, so I was dumb enough to roll down the window and got a perfect look at it. This huge craft literally just floating in the air. It had enough lights on itself to illuminate its silhouette. It was massive, 
It was a large, weird, diamond-shaped craft hovering in the night sky. I was immediately petrified and said to my fiancé, what is that? I rolled my window back up so fast and I said, that's not a plane, and that's not a car, and that's not an airboat because it's up in the air, and it's following us. Had it been an airboat, they'd have to twist and turn because of the tall mangroves. It was now going in the same direction we were going, in a perfectly straight line, and keeping up with our speed, mile per mile, parallel to us. I blurted out that maybe it was a reflection of the car's headlights on the road, which somehow bounced off the water and somehow illuminated the sky. I knew it sounded absolutely ridiculous, and I could tell my fiancé was trying not to say, are you serious? But I was absolutely desperate for it to be something anything other than what it was, and hope just to explain it away. I'm horrified to say this next part, but my fiancé was driving a Porsche 911 at the time, and said, we're getting out of here, and then floored it. We topped 120 miles in just a few seconds, and it kept up. We knew it wasn't an airboat, because they don't fly up in the air, and no plane or helicopter that does fly has lights like that. Airboats also don't go over 50 miles per hour. So what was this thing? My fiance slowed back down, and it did too. Then we sped up, and it did too. At one point, we braked hard and came to a dead stop, and it did too, on a dime, in the air. We did this cat and mouse for a few more times, each with the same result. So we sat in the middle of the highway lanes, idling, waiting for a few minutes to see its next move, and it felt more like ours. And the scariest part of all, it slowly moved right above us, and we both got a crystal clear look at the craft. It was definitely an oddly shaped diamond, with a pointed V front, with a row of lights and a series of sets of lights under the belly of the craft. We didn't have cell phones back then, and my camera and bag were in the trunk, but what I would have given to get a photo of this, it was massive. Rows of perfectly set lights lined from front and under the belly. It was dark in color, but since it was so pitch black outside, my best guess is that it was like a dark gunmetal gray, or dark gray or black, but it was almost graceful in the way it moved to hover above us. We now knew what we were seeing. This was a UFO. We sat there frozen, watching and holding hands and pondering what to do next. So we got out of there as fast as we can. I think we hit close to 140 miles per hour, and it was right there, back on the passenger side, still gliding parallel over the marshy Everglades. I was absolutely hysterical at this point, having seen close encounters of the third kind as a kid, and nearing a panic attack, and at the same time twisting around to look out each window to see where it was. My fiance stayed cool, telling me to keep us posted on what it was doing. I could barely see I was so hysterical, but I tell you one thing, at 100 miles per hour I was silently praying to see a cop, some red and blue lights glowing behind us, and would have almost wished to get pulled over instead of this moment that we were in. But then, just like that, it turned and went away, seemingly back into the direction where it first appeared, back over the marsh and swamps and the mangroves further into the Everglades. We could see the lights getting further and further away. My fiancé pulled over and parked. It was definitely leaving, and we watched it eventually disappear completely into the distance. We stayed by the side of the road for a few minutes, until we both calmed down. Without saying a word, we started back down the road and drove the rest of the way to my parents, talking about what we encountered. I think we both needed to seriously process what the heck we had just seen and experienced. To this day, we know what we saw. There's no doubt. Neither of us are crazy, and there's just absolutely no explaining it away. But what we don't know is exactly what it wanted, or why it chose to show itself, to follow us, to track us, and to keep up with us at those speeds. But maybe it was just curious. Whatever this craft was, this UFO, it clearly was just checking things out, because it did choose to leave us alone in the end. We weren't beamed up and we never saw any creatures operating it. We just saw the outer shape of it. It played a game of cat and mouse in the pitch black of the rural Everglades of Florida. And maybe for whatever reason, it just wanted to know what we were, 
just as we tried to figure out what it was. Having said that, I would never recommend those speeds under any circumstances, and we now have cell phones and the road assistance and other means of safety. I'm also happy to report that the road is now an interstate with a lot more traffic, better roads and more lanes, added lights and safety precautions. We even have plenty of police. You've probably even seen this road in popular TV shows like Dexter and CSI Miami, just without the UFOs. And in case anyone is wondering, and in case if anyone is wondering, we did take the drive a few more times to visit my parents, including when our children were born. But the trip was never the same after that. We only drove in the daytime, with all eyes watching the road, the sky, the Everglades, and all the alligators lying about. My parents eventually sold their condo in Naples and moved back to Miami. Thank goodness for that. Anyways, thanks for listening to our story. Stay safe and take care. Hi there, Donovan. I'm writing to you from Manhattan. I know your fans usually tend to be from rural areas, and the encounters happen like at parks and stuff, but I saw something this week that I think you might be interested in. There's no room in the city for creatures like Bigfoot, but there's lots of room for other small critters. I know now that there's more wildlife in the city than just pigeons and subway rats. And I think that there's an organization here that's dedicated to making sure New Yorkers don't find out about them. I work doing DoorDash and Uber Eats all over Manhattan. I got my own little electric bike and I can bring in about $100 for three hours of work. So it's a pretty good gig. That being said, I tend to work some odd hours and can get myself in some sketchy situations. My old bike was stolen when I was inside of a building. They even cut through my chain lock. I was only gone for like three minutes, but it's ruthless here and people can really take advantage of one another. After that, I always try to keep my eye out during my deliveries. It's been a few times now that I've seen some shady characters down in the subway at night, and it's not the usual homeless dudes or drunks or the usual criminal types. In fact, these guys are like the exact opposite. They're almost like the men in black characters, and I feel kind of dumb saying that, but they really do look like them. They're usually wearing full suits and ties and sometimes they've got sunglasses on. I've only seen men and they're always in pairs of two or groups of three. They kind of walk in sync like left foot, right foot, and on a dime. Usually one of them is holding a backpack by the top handle. Not crazy or unheard of, I mean lots of men who are in finance have backpacks. But there was just something about these guys that seemed out of place. When it's late like that at night, the only people out are usually inebriated or sleeping on the benches. 90% of the time, they've just got their noses in their phones and headphones in. After my bike got stolen, I've been extra diligent and keep my eyes up all of the time. It was like 2 a.m. and I was trying to figure out if I could catch the J at Bowery Station in Lower Manhattan. No one else really was down there not even the usual characters. I was standing on the platform when two of those guys in suits came out. They were acting more frantic than usual and talking to each other in hushed voices. I'm just standing there and out of the corner of my eye, I see a rat crawl on the tracks. It's pretty typical for these critters to live down there and I've certainly seen my fair share over the years. One even ran over my foot while I was waiting for a ride once. But this rat was like running so fast. It was definitely trying to get away from something and it was moving frantically. I felt bad for the little thing and thought maybe it knew that being on the tracks was dangerous. When the two men spotted the rat, they stopped talking right away and walked right onto the yellow marker next to the track. Now, if you're a New Yorker, you know you should never get that close to the rail and definitely shouldn't jump down onto the tracks. But that's exactly what they did because in the next instant, the two men were on the floor and one scooped up the rat into a backpack. I was just standing there shocked and confused, and I maybe let out a gasp, but I definitely didn't want to get involved. Once the rat was in the guy's backpack, the entire thing started shaking, and obviously he was trying to get out. It was more strong than a normal rodent though, like it was desperate, and I could tell it was hitting something metal inside the bag. As they were climbing up and off the tracks, the dude dropped the bag and I could see it starting to rip. The rat was chewing the fabric to bits 
and I could hear metal scraping like a few seconds later. The wrap popped out of the bag, but when it came out, it looked a lot different than it did when it went in. It was like a foot long, with a wide barreled body and these huge sharp teeth. Its eyes were glowing red and its hair was standing up straight at all angles. This thing had yellow claws, and it didn't look scared anymore. Instead, it was like frothing at the mouth and angry. The two guys looked terrified and jumped back away from it. We started to hear the subway coming from around the corner, and that giant rat heard it too, because its ears started twitching and it ducked into a hole in the grate that led under the platform. The guys pulled out their phones and started to call someone, but I just realized I needed to get out of there as soon as possible. So I hopped onto the train and headed home. Now I've seen these men before, but I had no idea that they could have been involved in something like this. I don't know if that rat was a mutant or a lab rat or what, but something was seriously wrong about it, and it basically shape-shifted right before my eyes. I'm going to stay out of that subway at night, but I'll write in if I see any more of these creatures. Thanks for sharing my story, and stay safe. Hi Donovan, I really appreciate what you're doing with the show. I've got a sighting from this past winter that I want to put out there, and I think you'll enjoy it. So I'm a park ranger in upstate New York. I generally stick around in the winter even though that's a slow time for the park, because I like the quiet. A big part of the job around that time is collecting all the litter and stuff that's been left behind. We have to grab it before the snow comes, or it'll stay there until spring and make an even bigger mess. Me and another ranger, George, set out on a litter run one day. We set out pretty early, like 5 in the morning, because we were going to have a blizzard starting that week. Everyone had been working overtime because we all wanted to leave before it hit. Now, there's a river that runs to the south side of the park. People tend to get real careless around the river. They try to feed the fish, and then they end up drinking and leaving all kinds of litter. I was in charge of making sure the riverbank was absolutely clear. We can't afford to have anything that isn't supposed to be there, because it's a real fragile ecosystem. So me and George start walking along the riverbank. George is really good at spotting animal tracks, and noticing if anything came into the area before us. We'd only been walking for a few minutes when he says he sees these hoof prints. And we don't allow horseback riding in the park. None of the rangers have horses either, so my first thought is that he must be mistaken. We've all been pulling 14 hour days and hopped up on coffee. It wouldn't be surprised if he started to see things, but then he shows me and he's right. There's a trail of these tracks that walks right up to the edge of the river, then doubles back into the forest. And the prints are huge. George says that it's gotta be as big as a horse, but it's walking on two feet. And we both know that that doesn't make any sense. I'm not freaked out, but like something feels off, you know? And I'm the senior ranger, so I have to make the call on whether we follow those tracks or not. And I say we go. So we follow these tracks into the forest. We can tell that the animal is headed southeast. But we've got no clue how long it's been out there. And this is a pretty dense section of the park. Between the mud, the frost, and the undergrowth, it must have had a tough time of it. But the prints were pretty deep, so whatever it was was pretty heavy. George thinks it might have come from the highway way out at the edge of the park. It might be someone's exotic pet that fell off a truck or got lost. We've had situations like that before, and it's always a headache. But we follow the tracks for about 20 minutes, and then all of a sudden, I smell rotten eggs. It makes me want to gag. We can't tell where it's coming from, so we just keep pushing forward. There's a spot where the animal's trail gets really confusing. George says it might have hurt itself and had to start dragging one of its legs. He says the trail ends right at this hollowed out tree. We approach the tree cautiously as we can. We don't know if the animal is inside and we can't afford to get hurt. Now the rotten egg smell is really strong and almost metallic. I have to cover my mouth, it's so bad. George looks inside the tree and starts poking at something. He pulls out this thin, stinky, wet pile of fabric. Neither of us have an explanation for it, but then he stretches it out and we see that it's covered in scales. And I realize that it's not fabric, it's a skin, like a giant lizard or something shed it off. There's the part that would be the torso, and two long sleeves what must have been the arms. 
And we were right. It's got to be human sized. George holds up the skin like a shirt and he could fit inside it easily. Now both of us are ready to call it a day. I radio back to the station for the other rangers. I tell them an estimate of where we are and what we found. There's no sign of the animal. We have no way to tell if it's watching us. George and I head back for the vehicle as fast as we can without making too much noise. When we get back to the station and tell the other rangers, they have a bunch of questions that I don't know how to answer. I don't think anyone would have believed us if we didn't bring back that skin. The head ranger decides we should all avoid the area for the time being. I think he hoped that whatever it was would leave so that we wouldn't have to deal with it. I know I did. We all hustled to finish our work over the next few days. I cleared out before that blizzard hit. I was away from the park for about three weeks. When we all came back, the first thing the head ranger had us do was head out to that river area. He wanted to know if there were any signs of that animal. I was hoping it died from the cold, honestly. The snow had thawed a little. It was easy to lead the team to where George and I first found those tracks. Of course, they were buried now. Finding the tree was much harder, though. We patrolled within a two, maybe a three mile radius of where George and I found the skin. When nothing came up, we were all pretty relieved. Maybe that thing had migrated. We didn't know. There are no reptiles native to our park. We're too far north and the cold would kill them. But over the spring and summer, we kept finding these chunks of lizard skin. Nothing as big as the one George and I brought back, but large enough to be concerning. They all had the same sulfury smell. Maybe the thing is getting injured. I don't know. The park visitors haven't spotted anything yet. George found a trail of hoof prints at the edge of a campsite last week. Whatever this creature is, it's tried to hide so far. We don't know how it might interact with humans or if someone could get hurt. Thanks for listening. Whatever this thing is, if I manage to get my eyes on it, I'll let you know. Hey there, Donovan. I'm writing in to you from Pittsburgh. I had an experience earlier this year, and I don't know many people to tell. I figured you'd might be a good fit. I'm a police officer and I usually get put on the night shift with my partner Jack. Our beat is usually pretty quiet. Sometimes we'll get a domestic disturbance or have to bust some kid's party, but in general our neighborhood doesn't give us much to do. We had a fairly hot summer for Pittsburgh. People had their AC on full blast, basically from the end of June, and would short out their power. And most of the people in this neighborhood are seniors. We got a lot of calls asking us to escort people to the hospital for heat stroke. It was actually worse at night because people just couldn't cool down. One of those calls was from an older lady. She had been retired for years and lives with her son, but he was out of town on a business trip. He hadn't heard from her in a few days and asked us to go check on her at night. She didn't answer the door, but I could hear the TV on inside. Jack and I circled around the back and hopped the fence. Once we were in her yard, I could see that she was in the kitchen. From the window, it sounded like she was talking to someone in the other room, but I couldn't make out the words. I knocked on the back door and asked her to let us in. She looked surprised to see us standing there, so I explained that her son had sent us. She came out into the yard and told us that she needed a place to stay, because she didn't want to be in that house. At that point, Jack and I were concerned. I asked her if someone was in there with her. She said no. I asked her if she was in danger, and she said she wasn't sure. That just made us more confused. She told us that she had been seeing things over the past couple of weeks. Doors opening and closing by themselves. Footsteps in the attic. That sort of thing. When she went to sleep, she felt like someone was standing over her. She said she didn't tell her son about it because she didn't want him to think she was crazy. We didn't know what to say to that. If it was anyone else, I would have thought they were joking. But this lady didn't seem like that. And I'm thinking, alright, she's almost 80 years old. She's not used to being alone. Maybe she just worked herself up. Jack and I asked if we could go in her house and take a look around. I told her that we'd stay with her while she packed an overnight bag. I could tell she really didn't want to let us in. Maybe she thought it was dangerous. I don't know. But she led us back into the house. We searched the house, but we didn't find anything out of the ordinary. No one was in there but us. We checked all the closets and under the beds and there was nothing. We told this lady that we didn't see anything, 
but she insisted that something was in her house. We waited in the bedroom while she packed. Then we hear this stomping noise coming from upstairs. It sounded like somebody was jumping up and down in the attic. She got really spooked, so I told Jack to wait with her while I checked it out. The attic was full of junk and old boxes. It was dusty too, like no one had been up there in ages. I waved my flashlight around to see if I could spot a raccoon or something, but no one was up there but me, and there weren't any windows either, so it wasn't like anything could have blown in from the outside. I was just about to head back downstairs when I heard this stomping again. It sounded like it was right in front of me, and I'm telling you, I was looking at nothing but thin air. I even walked over to where it was coming from and moved some boxes out of the way. Every time I went forward, the stomping jumped back, like whatever it was had to keep moving backwards so that we wouldn't be on top of each other. I didn't know what to tell this lady or my partner. I didn't have an explanation for what I was hearing, and I had to believe my own two eyes, even if it didn't make any sense. I knew that she hadn't been wrong, but I didn't know if confirming her fears would be so good for her. So I went back downstairs and told Jack to check out the attic. If he didn't have the same experience as me, I figured I could just write it all off. I got this lady out of the house and set her up with her friend a few blocks down. When I got back to the house, Jack was standing outside. He said he had something to tell me and that he didn't want me to laugh. That's how I knew we heard the same thing. When I got back to the house, Jack was standing outside. We weren't really sure what to do. It's not like we could do a stakeout and hope the ghost showed itself. We weren't even sure it was a ghost. I called this lady's son to let him know that his mother was fine and we got her out of there. Anyways, that was this summer. I check on her every so often and she says she's still hearing things. Her son started hearing and seeing things too. Now they're debating whether to sell the house or not. Hi Donovan, I'm actually writing in on behalf of my dad, who listens to your channel occasionally when we happen to be in a car together. The best part about this is it brings us a little closer together. My dad is a pretty quiet guy and has always kept to himself. He's a wastewater maintenance worker for years and has worked long hours. We're getting to bond now that I'm older and he's retired. We recently stopped by this local diner to grab some dinner together. I'm in college now about four hours away from home, but head back some weekends to visit. After settling in and ordering, my dad asked me if I had experienced anything weird at my college. It's a well-known school in the far north of the northeast and has a ton of haunted history. I told him that I never personally experienced anything, but a lot of the students in my building have seen things here and there, mostly ghostly figures that are said to roam the grounds. I explained that I wasn't opposed to seeing something, and I was thinking of going out late at night with a few friends who hadn't had a ghost experience yet. My dad sitting across the booth from me shuddered and said I should avoid those kind of encounters at all costs. That of course caught my attention. Neither of my parents are very religious, and I can't remember them ever talking about anything supernatural or paranormal, but it sounded like my dad had some personal experience here a reason behind his warning. I kept it casual knowing that prying too hard would probably make him clam up and asked him if he ever experienced anything himself. He mauled it over for a while. Our food was served, so we got interrupted, but eventually grunted and admitted that he had when he was about my age. For some background, my dad grew up near the shore in New England. He lived in a coastal town that today has a small commercial fishing fleet and a power plant all on the mouth of a river. I've only been there once or twice, the last time right after my grandmother passed, and we cleared out their house. It was sad, but nothing spooky. I thought the town was cool, very beach-centered with some seafood shacks on almost every street. Anyway, my dad went to the local high school and was part of the normal group of guys, meaning that they got into a little bit of trouble here and there, nothing serious but enough to get the blood moving and they often pushed each other with dares. About 10 minutes away from his high school, right up on the shoreline, there's an old abandoned building. I asked if it was still there, and he said it is, although he never went back to see it. From what I understand, it was used as a tuberculosis treatment center for kids at one point. 
the government set it up and maintained it during an epidemic. Sea air is supposed to help with lung issues, so a lot of kids went there to get better. When it started emptying out, the government repurposed it into an asylum. They put a lot of mentally unhealthy people in there, but unfortunately, as most people are aware these days, the treatments used to be pretty bad back then. It was shut down a few years after it opened up due to neglect and abuse, and then abandoned. The government, to this day, still owns the property. They never knocked the buildings down. All through high school, my dad and his friends had heard about the asylum, and once they reached their senior year, they got into the usual dare match and decided to go there one afternoon. This was kind of sketchy since the area was regularly patrolled, but one of his friends claimed that he knew a back way and through the hole in a fence. After school, they rode their bikes to this abandoned asylum and hid them in some bushes off the road. The friend then led the group to the fence. Everyone ducked in and they were on the grounds. My dad cleared his throat a lot and seemed reluctant to keep telling this story, but I gave him a little space. I think he really just wanted to get this off of his chest after all these years. Eventually, he continued and told me about how they only made it to the first floor ground level when strange things started happening. First, they heard this metal door slam. A lot of windows had been broken out in the building, and it was exposed to the outdoors, so the group stuck together, thinking that a random person had just shown up or was waiting around to scare visitors. But as they went in the opposite direction of the sound, peeking into rooms here and there, they started to hear footsteps. The steps were pretty loud in the empty building and hurried. My dad waited in the hallway outside one room that gave him the heebie-jeebies, as he said, so he was alone when he heard the footsteps rushing towards him. He whirled around and shouted as a shape came at him, flinging up his arms, but no one ran into him, and when he looked, there was no one there. His friends all piled out of the room, freaked out, and asked what happened. He told them, and although they made fun of him a bit, everyone agreed to leave quickly after that. The worst part was, he told me, the footsteps didn't stop. The group could hear the sound slowly following them out of the building, and it took everything in my dad not to run. That's one dare they didn't repeat. They were only in the building for maybe 15 minutes, but my dad insists there's no point in exposing yourself to the unknown. He made me promise not to creep around my college looking for ghosts, but I might give it a shot anyway. You have to see it to believe it, right? I was working as a park ranger in Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont. It was one of my childhood dreams to live in the forest and protect nature. I was a pretty idealistic kid. When I was little, I used to love the Smokey the Bear commercials on TV. They were my favorite, and he was my hero for some reason. So I was living my dream. I really loved it all. I spent a lot of my time just patrolling the trails and making sure everything was in good order. And there was a surprising amount of search and rescue missions too. I was amazed at how unprepared some people were when they decided to spend time in the woods. I did plenty of brush clearing and removing of fallen trees. That's how I ended up in this situation. I was almost done with my patrol one evening when I spotted a tree that seemed to be halfway sawn through. Whoever had been camping there apparently thought it was okay to cut down whole trees. I couldn't believe it, and how they chose to cut that one was just beyond me. I was in a really awkward place on the side of a hill with a ton of brush under it. It looked really precarious, like it could fall at any time. I was walking back to the ATV to get my chainsaw. Then across the road through the trees, I saw what looked like to be large saplings stacked together in kind of a teepee shape. There were two of those structures that I could see through the woods, and it was just really irritating me to think that these campers felt free to take down those young trees. I got my chainsaw out of the ATV and went back to do my cutting. When I got back to the tree, I had seen that it wasn't a saw that had been used. It looked like something had pushed it until it started to splinter, which didn't seem possible unless you used a heavy-duty truck or something but a truck couldn't reach that spot. I was ready to take it down when I heard this tree limb snap. Before I could even turn around, I was pinned under this huge branch. It landed across my thighs and one of my arms. I was pinned down there with the rest of the tree, threatening to fall any minute. 
It was unfrickin' believable. I was so grateful that I was able to reach my radio and call for help. I was trapped, but I wasn't in terrible pain. I could wiggle my fingers and I didn't feel like anything was broken. I had grazed my head on the way down, so I was bleeding. I felt like a real fool for getting myself in that position. It was starting to get dark and I was getting really uncomfortable. I lay there for close to an hour before the rescue truck got to me. It wasn't hard for two people to get the branch off of me. I was able to move everything fine and I didn't feel too bad considering. I felt okay to walk even though I was pretty stiff and limping a little. It was protocol that I be taken in for observation though. There was no major hospital close by, but there was this old rural clinic in the area so that's where they took me. It was dark by then, but I remember the moon was almost full because everything was still pretty visible. When we got there, the place looked more like an old house than anything. We were surprised to see this big military truck parked out in front. You know the kind that you see in a convoy on the highway? There were soldiers doing something in the back. We went up a ramp to the entrance, but we were confronted by a guard in a combat uniform holding some kind of rifle. He told us there was no access through here. We explained my situation, but he said we would have to go to one of the other outbuildings, and he would let someone know that we were there. We turned around to go back down the ramp. Then there was a bunch of shouting coming from the soldiers by the truck. They're shouting, clamp it down tighter, don't let it go, and they're obviously struggling with something inside of the truck. And then I heard the loudest, wildest yelp coming from the back of the truck. Primal, like a primal kind of scream. I limped down to the end of the ramp and was hit by this really horrible stench. The yelping went on and on. I just felt heartsick for whatever it was, but also terrified. Me and the guys with me just stood there. We felt paralyzed by this bizarre situation. Then the front door of the clinic bursts open and someone in a white coat comes flying down the ramp holding something in one hand. The guard at the door yelled at us to get out of there and to go to the other building. We were heading away, but we kept looking behind us, and the white coat guy was being helped up to reach into the truck, and then a couple of minutes, everything got really quiet. We reached the door of the outbuilding and just stood there watching. They were letting down the tailgate, and then all of them pulled out what looked like a giant stretcher, Something huge was underneath that sheet, but when they were jostling it down, something like a big hairy foot got uncovered. I couldn't tell the color, but it was huge and very hairy. The toes almost looked human. The guard opened the entrance door, and they carried it inside. That's all I know. There's nothing about that night that I can explain. In the 90s, I lived in a rental house in a kind of a questionable area. I was recently divorced and it was the only place I could afford for me and the kids. But still, I really liked the place, so I was disappointed when I got an unexpected letter from the landlord. The place was up for sale and I only had a month to get out. I had no idea I was going to find an affordable place that quick. I got obsessed with looking at real estate ads and driving around neighborhoods looking for rent signs. Everything was out of my price range. Then someone at work told me about this program that could help me buy a house. I never considered that. I mean, my income was really pathetic back then. But I decided to look into it and after a ton of paperwork and jumping through a lot of hoops, I got qualified to buy a low cost house. I started looking at every house I could find in the Louisville area. I can't begin to describe the crap that I was seeing. These houses were at the very low end of the market. One of them was so trashed and actually had graffiti on the inside. I got discouraged, but one day I happened to drive by a house in the same neighborhood I was living in. It was actually a really cute house. It was an old Victorian. I got an appointment to see it, and I was surprised how much better it looked than all the others in that price range. I bid on it right away, and before I knew it, I was actually a homeowner. It happened so fast. I didn't really have time to check everything out thoroughly. We were moving in and the neighbors came outside and we introduced ourselves. They were two guys probably in their early 50s. They were roommates and seemed nice enough. One was Bud and the other one was Vern. They weren't very well groomed. Their clothes were old and ratty and their hair was uncombed and scraggly. Not to judge, but they didn't seem to be taking care of themselves at all. And they seemed to be unemployed. Every now and then they'd get their water shut off for non-payment they would request that I sling my garden hose over the fence to borrow some water. 
I always said yes. I kind of felt sorry for them and wondered about their situation. As time went on, we found out that they had a lot of animals living with them. Every so often, they'd bring one of their animals out to play on their lawn. There was such a variety. Hedgehogs, snakes, lizards, different rodents. I mean, a lot of animals. It seemed odd that they were feeding so many pets when they obviously had very little money. But some people really love animals. One night, I was putting my kids to bed, and I happened to look out the window and could see into their kitchen. These old houses were built really close together, like 18 inches apart. I didn't mean to spy, but I noticed their curtains moving in a strange way. I kept looking intently until I was horrified to realize that there were cockroaches. Hundreds of cockroaches were running up and down their curtains on their walls. I was beyond creeped out. That explained why sometimes I'd find a cockroach or two in my house. They were visitors from next door. That was so unacceptable to me. It was one of the few things I absolutely could not stand. I called a pest control company the next day. When they came out, I told them that what I had seen, and I said I wanted the perimeter of my house secured. They said it was doubtful that I'd be able to keep them away, if there were truly that many cockroaches. I assured them I wasn't exaggerating. They said I probably need to talk to the neighbors and get them to participate in some pest control also. It was agonizing for me, but that evening I forced myself to go next door and I knocked on their front door. No one answered. The front of the house looked dark, but I saw lights towards the back. Their house bordered the alley, so I walked down it to their back gate to check the backyard. I reached to knock on the gate, but when I touched it, it opened. I didn't see Bud or Vern. There was a low wattage light on their porch, and it was lighting up this huge animal cage about five feet tall. I was curious about it as I hadn't seen them bring out any animals very large before. Something big and hairless was in there. It was crouched with its back to me. When it heard the gate creak, it turned around and I immediately screamed. There's no way to describe this, but the best way to put it is that its face was a mix between a man and a dinosaur. Its yellow eyes looked right at me. It grabbed the bars of the cage with these big black claws. It looked at me hatefully and started to stand up. I swear it was at least as tall as the cage. I was terrified and slammed the gate and ran home. I was shaking like crazy. I couldn't believe it. Were those smaller animals food for that horrible thing? I ended up looking up the property records for that house and found out Bud and Vern were renting it from an absentee owner. I reported the condition of the house to her and told her there was an extremely large and unusual thing living in the backyard. By the next month, they had been evicted and there was no sign left of anyone. The house was gutted and remodeled. No one would ever know what it had been like before. Hello, Donovan. Thanks for the chance for me to tell your story on your channel. I'm not really new to the paranormal or cryptid community, but I wanted to add an experience of my own in case any listeners out there have had something similar happen to them. I've discussed this experience with a few close friends, and they all seemed surprised how direct it was. When it happened, I remember thinking it was odd. Usually when you hear ghost stories, they don't involve direct contact, but mine does. For some background, I've always had nightmares as a kid, and I still do. There's not really an explanation for it. When I was younger, I wasn't exactly watching The Exorcist or anything, so I'm really not sure why they cropped up. We lived in a normal house, a raised ranch that my parents had bought in the 80s and remodeled from a really trashy 60s setup. It was a comfortable place, roomy enough for my brother and I. I don't even remember feeling like anything paranormal was around. As I mentioned, nightmares were really common for me. They became so routine that I'd wake up almost the same time every night, just after midnight, and stay awake for a bit until my body calmed down enough to get back to sleep. When this happened, I was probably 11 or 12, so for years I'd been following the same routine. I woke up at the same time I always did, flicked on the lamp on my nightstand and just kind of sat propped up for a bit. That night was a pretty rough nightmare though, I think something about a person breaking into the house. Those are the worst for me because they're so realistic. I also slept at the far end of the house on the second floor, away from any exits, so I think I was hyper aware of that too. Even now, in my early 30s, I still check all the windows and door locks at night and basically have an escape plan. 
We had a family dog named Baxter that always slept in my room. It was summer and pretty hot, so he was sleeping on the hardwood floor because it was cooler. Baxter always made me feel better when I was freaked out, because I knew he'd react if something was up. He was sleeping soundly even with the light on, so my racing heart calmed down a little. I tried to wait it out, but felt really on edge for some reason. I kept reminding myself that Baxter would freak out if something was wrong, but it wasn't helping. Like I said, I was 11 or 12 at the time, and I hate to admit this, but I was scared enough that I decided to go in my parents' room. I used to do this a lot when I was younger, a lot younger, and would just sleep in their bed or on the floor next to their bed in a pile of blankets. They weren't thrilled with it, but as I got older, I stopped doing it, so it wasn't an issue anymore. This night, I slowly got out of bed and kept trying to talk myself out of it. It was so embarrassing, but I just couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. I grabbed my comforter and quietly opened the door, turned on the hall light and hightailed it down the hallway to the room. My mom woke up a little when I knocked and explained that I couldn't sleep. She sighed but agreed that I could sleep on the floor. They had a pretty big room and an expanse of floor between the end of the bed and the far wall where they had a television. I hunkered down near the TV and got comfortable, my eyes adjusting to the dark as I did so. I had just started to drift off to sleep when I felt something move the blanket near my feet. Now this is a habit of mine. I have to sleep with my feet covered. I usually even roll them up in the blanket a little like a sleeping bag. As I lay there, snapping awake again quickly, I felt the blanket get peeled off my feet and the air against them. Moving only my legs, I kicked the blanket around until my feet were covered up by it again and anchored the edge under my heels. I was practically holding my breath and had just started to calm down a little more when it happened again. Laying there in disbelief, I didn't move an inch as the blanket peeled slowly away from my feet. It was tugged from under my heels and I felt the air against my toes. Baxter, I thought, it had to be the dog, but I frantically remembered that he had stayed in my room asleep on the floor. He hadn't followed me into my parents' room. I looked across the room at the door silently praying that it was open and he had crept in, but it wasn't. As I did this, of course I had to look at my feet where the blanket had moved. There was nothing there. I took another quick glance around and there was nothing or no one on the floor with me. I put my head back down and waited, almost scared to breathe. Minutes went by. Just when I was starting to get comfortable, it happened again, almost like a game. This went on for about a half an hour. I would adjust the blanket acting as if nothing was wrong, and it would get moved again, sometimes almost up to my knees. I was freaking out at first, but then nothing else happened. I guess I just began to accept it. I have no idea what was messing with me that night, but eventually it stopped and I was so mentally and emotionally exhausted I passed out. No one else in my family ever mentioned an experience like this, and it never happened again. I'm guessing whatever it was wasn't malevolent, maybe just a passing spirit. So as a PSA, keep in mind that not every paranormal experience is malicious. I have a freaky experience that happened to me a little while ago. I'm an avid explorer and I love checking out abandoned buildings and stuff like that. I was never a believer in the paranormal, but now I just don't know. There is at least more out there than we care to admit. One day I was hiking and I saw a mouth of a cave. It looked awesome and I went inside to check things out. It was far too dark to go without a flashlight, so I figured I'd return the next day and check it out once I had a flashlight with me. The next day I was planning on making a day of exploring the cave. I packed myself a nice lunch, plenty of water, and a flashlight and headed back to the cave. When I arrived where I thought the cave was at, there was nothing there. I'm pretty good with directions and do this sort of thing all the time, but I must have gotten the location wrong. I spent hours retracing my steps and trying to find the cave again, but it was nowhere to be found. Finally, it started getting dark and I was going to head back to my car, but I decided to do one more trip to find the location. When I got to the location I originally thought the cave was at, there it was again. I swear I visited that exact spot at least five times that day. There's a slight possibility I was mistaken, but I'm telling you, I retraced my steps and mapped out where I had walked 
and where I hadn't walked trying to find this damn cave. It was like it just appeared suddenly out of nowhere. I wasn't crazy about the idea of going into the cave then, for a couple of reasons. First, it was starting to get dark, so if bats chased me out of there or something, it would be more difficult to find my way out. Secondly, if I broke my ankle or something, nobody would be around to help. Also, the park was about to close, and it's technically illegal to be out there. And it's technically illegal to be out there that late. I'll be honest though, the very last one rarely stopped me. I spent all day looking for that cave, and I didn't want to go home without achieving my goal. I turned on my flashlight and I went in there. It was pretty cool at first. It went way deeper into the earth than I figured it would. And there were all kinds of stalactites and stalagmites, and many natural beauties that no human hand had probably ever touched. I've been to caves before, but this thing was seriously gorgeous. I was surprised it wasn't more well known, and that the park didn't close it off to try to preserve it. It was worth the wait and spending the whole day trying to find it. You could hear some serious echoes reverberate all through the cave. Every step I took, you could hear an echo all around. It was pretty cool. I yelled a couple of times to hear how long it would take for it to return to complete silence. I eventually got to the point where I couldn't walk on the rock anymore. It dropped off into this huge room. It was much bigger than my flashlight would allow me to see. But what I could see was amazing. And I could tell by the sounds of the echoes that it was huge. I started heading back and I noticed this part of the cave that I didn't see before. It was a small opening that I had to sort of crawl through. When I got to the other side, it opened up into a small room with a hole in it. When I flashed the light at the hole, I saw huge glowing orange eyes. I freaked out and froze. There was a small gray skinned creature that had arms and legs similar to a human, but much more gangly and spindly. Its head was much bigger than its small skinny body. We just looked at each other for a little while and then it picked up a rock. I was terrified and crawled back through the opening as fast as I could. I got the hell out of that cave. Everybody I've told this to makes fun of me and says it's Gollum from Lord of the Rings, but it absolutely terrified me. In hindsight, going spelunking in caves alone is probably not a good idea. I've read stories of bears living in caves, so I guess I should consider myself lucky for not being mauled to death but I wasn't able to find anything about creatures matching that description that dwell in caves. That nasty thing's glowing orange eyes are still burned into my memory, and I don't know what to think about what it was about to do to me with that rock. I don't necessarily know if I believe in ghosts and stuff now, but I'm not arrogant enough to say outright that they don't exist. Nobody I've explained this story to has been able to give me a reasonable explanation for what I saw. Was it an alien? Was it some sort of demon? Did I discover some sort of new species? I just don't know what the hell I saw in that cave. Do you or any of your viewers have any idea what that could have been? Donovan, I'm telling you this because I'm scared. I know you can't really do anything for me, but sometimes it just helps to tell someone, you know? I work as a line operator in South Dakota. I live in Wall, which you might know if you've ever driven through the state and see all those Wall drug signs. I'm about to go looking for a job there, even though being a line operator pays better. Reason for that is, a couple weeks ago, a guy I work with named Tony just disappeared. He was working a line out in Quinn, edge of town there. No one knows what happened to him. They found all of his tools and some ripped up clothes, but that's it. He was just gone. Some people say it was because he just caught his wife cheating and he just run off. But then, why would he go to all that trouble to tear up his own clothes? And why would he leave his pickup parked next to that utility pole? I didn't believe it then, but I sure don't know. We got two things in South Dakota that shouldn't mix, and that's chemical plants and reptiles. Snakes, lizards, frogs, turtles, salamanders. I don't know what all. I believe what got Tony was reptilian. I wouldn't believe it though if I hadn't seen it myself. When you're working on a line, they tell you not to look around. You gotta focus on the job for one thing. It's a dangerous job. Guys have been electrocuted. For one, you're up pretty high. We use safety gear of course, but nothing's foolproof. 
Most of the time I follow that rule. I get up there, do what I gotta do and get back down. But one day it was pretty hot and the wind was blowing hard. People who haven't lived in the Great Plains don't really get what wind is like. Makes you feel like the world's trying to get rid of you. I heard the wind blowing something around, I thought. So I glanced down and there was this ugliest creature that I've ever seen. At first, I thought it had to be a dude in a costume. Someone playing a prank, you know. That thing had a snake-like head and these yellow eyes. It stood up like a person, but instead of hands, it had claws. This thing was taller than a person too, like maybe eight or nine feet, and that's when it hit me. No way this was a guy in a costume. That's when I got scared. This line was along a rural road. I couldn't see anything around except for corn. The snake thing opened its mouth and showed me a bunch of its sharp teeth. Now, I know they're trying to say dinosaurs aren't reptiles, like they're really birds or something, but this thing looked prehistoric, like a dinosaur reptile thing. And it looked like it wanted to eat me, I was sure. It raised up its hand claw, and I nearly let go of the pole. If I had, the safety harness would have held me, but still. I had to fix that line, so I focused on it. I told myself that when I was done, it would be gone. It wasn't going to wait down there forever. I finished repairing that wire that had snapped off and looked down again. The dino thing was still there. It was broad daylight, and the thing was just standing there like it didn't care about anything. Like it owned the planes. I remembered Tony then, because that had happened a week before, and I had gone out there to where they found him. It wasn't this road, but it wasn't far maybe about a half mile down the road. By the time I got there, they had taken his clothes and stuff. I'd gotten close to the ground and looked around. There were dark drops in the dirt. Could have been blood, I wasn't sure. I also saw some tracks. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I was clinging to that pole, looking down at this dino thing. I knew it made those tracks. They look like the tracks lizards make, five long toes with claws on the end creepy now that I knew what they were. It was hot, but I felt freezing cold. I didn't know what to do. Did I have to stay up there until this thing went away? I thought if a car went by, maybe it would just leave. But I'd worked on this line before and had been hours without seeing anyone pass by. There was a farmhouse off in the distance, way too far away. This dino thing bared its teeth at me again in a grin, and I swear there was blood in those teeth. Suddenly, I wondered if I was hallucinating. Maybe this thing wasn't even there at all. Maybe I was just imagining it. I closed my eyes and told myself when I opened them, it'd be gone. You know, like when you see water down the road, but it's just a mirage. It was still there when I opened them. Reptiles can stay still for a long time, like snakes. I seen them sitting on a rock for hours, just soaking up the sun. I couldn't outlast it. I came up with a plan. I'd call someone and then get them to come. Either this thing would leave or we'd fight it off together. There was only one person who would come out there for me, Carl. Carl had nothing better to do. He lived down at the trailer park and had no job most of the time. I got out my phone and tried not to sound scared spitless. Hey Carl, my truck died. Want to come out here and pick me up? I hated lying, but it didn't matter right now. I was up a creek, you know. Those 10 minutes until he came seemed like forever. That dino thing didn't stop grinning, like it knew I couldn't stay up there forever. I heard the truck, tires on the pavement like the best thing you've ever heard in your life. I looked for it, strained my eyes down the road. When I looked back, that dino thing was gone. I climbed down the pole and I couldn't feel my legs. When I got to the ground, I fell to my butt. Carl must have thought I was nuts when he found me there in the grass, but he didn't say anything. I haven't seen that thing since, and I hope I never see it again.